You are Locked On Wolverines, your daily podcast on the Michigan Wolverines, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Happy Tuesday, National Signing Day, though there's not a lot when it comes to that. Locked On Wolverines podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, where it's your team every day. I'm your man on the ground, Isaiah Hole, publisher of Wolverines Wire through USA Today Sports Media Group. We are going to talk a little signing day stuff uh, because that's a good idea. And I'm going to pull up some stuff over here. We're going to, I lost my train of thought of where I, where I wanted to go with it. Obviously we'll discuss Cameron Brandt for a minute. Um, but before we get to that, obviously the first big news that hit Michigan today in a way, Tom Brady retires again, the goat hanging up the cleats. Hanging up the pewter helmet with the red. My Tampa Bay Buccaneers, which is occasionally my adopted team. They were in 2002. They were again two years ago. I have been, I I am uh, two for two. The two years I've decided at the beginning of the season that that was the NFL team I cared about. Granted, I still followed them and it's not to the same degree. Uh, But uh, Tom Brady with a heck of a career. Second time retiring, it sounds like it's for real this time. I mean, it was just very chill, nonchalant, the way that he comes out and says, hey, this is it, this is over, hanging him up. Uh, But uh, I was just on uh, with the the voice of college football, Mark Rogers, and he had asked about uh, Tom Brady, and I want to kind of reshare some of those sentiments that I had uh, about him. Uh, Obviously, his Michigan career was a lot better than what people – like to act like it was. And it's mostly Michigan State and Ohio State people that want to try to probably more Michigan State people than Ohio State people, uh, especially because that was the only team that beat Michigan in 1999, uh, my original freshman year. Uh, So I think that they're the ones who really uh, like to be like, you you know, you guys didn't really want Brady. And that might be true of some of the fans, but I don't know. I wasn't really paying attention to the fans. I didn't have the pulse of the fan base myself. I was like as wor- the worst Michigan football fan ever. I never, I never went to any games. I watched occasionally on TV, and Tom Brady I thought was the coolest thing ever. Um, I didn't know who Drew Henson was, and so when I did see Drew Henson, I was like, "Who's that?" So I might have been the only one, right? Literally the only one that wasn't rooting for Drew Henson. Now here's the thing, though: Tom Brady was a team captain. Tom Brady had like six to one snaps. You know, as far as the the amount that he played, he was certainly the starter, and eventually he rested that away from Henson for for good uh, down the stretch. Had some of the finest Michigan football moments in his career. Beat Ohio State, all of that kind of stuff, and I think even more importantly, and I am trying really hard not to cough here. I think even more importantly, it's the the impact Michigan had on Tom Brady. Because if you listen to Tom Brady talk about why he ended up being the GOAT, he often will mention Michigan in his time in Ann Arbor being the seventh round, or sorry, the seventh uh, on the depth chart and having to fight to get to where he's at. And I think that that, that battle with Drew Henson Because by the time he finally gets to number one, right, he climbs to number one. He watches the rest of his team. He watches Brian Greasy win a national championship. He knows what it takes. Next year, he earns the starting role uh, now that Greasy's gone. And he gets it for one year all to himself before having to split time with Drew Henson. Having to fend off a five-star. I mean, it's kind of akin to, in, in a way, but... You know, not quite because things didn't go his way to the Cade McNamara, J.J. McCarthy battle. And yet it ended up kind of going more J.J.'s way than it did uh, Drew Henson's. Right. So I I think that uh, he endured something similar, but kind of really asserted himself in a way. Cade was no slouch down the stretch, but he, he wasn't. He wasn't making the same types of plays that Tom Brady was with Tom Brady being the quarterback. And I think that that really kind of made Tom Brady who he was. That's what really kind of set him into uh, the gear that he needed to be. And I think that there was just a constant stream of disrespect that helped fuel him as well, right? 
He wasn't going to be that guy at Michigan. And when he was that guy, he still wasn't that guy. Even though his teammates gave, you know, gave him that vote of confidence, he didn't have the fan base's vote of confidence. Uh, then he's a sixth round pick and he's playing behind Drew Bledsoe. And yet that helps propel him to that next level. Right. And then he, people doubted him until they didn't. And then even then every year, it's like, when, how long is this going to continue? And then he leaves and goes to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. And the, the debate starts. Is it, is it Tom Brady or is it Bill Belichick and Tom Brady at the, uh, you know, young age of 44 years old, uh, or 43 or whatever it was older than I am currently, you know, I, you can't trust me to do anything in any sport. Right. <laughs> um, Except for maybe be a spectator. And even then, I don't know that I have the attention span unless it's Michigan football related. And even then, that's uh, Patrick Barron walks around and I've got to have my quips and whatever. So, um, I mean, that really speaks to just his ability to be a competitor, his ability to continue uh, to push the, the limits. And, uh, you know, he'll sit there and say, Michigan is what built him. Now, I have a final story that I mentioned on that uh, on that other podcast that I do want to mention here that speaks to his confidence. Uh, and I don't know that I shared this. I may have a long time ago, but I don't remember. So uh, in 2016, week three, when he came to visit for it was the second time back after he had graduated and moved on to the NFL, um, he was there for the Colorado game. We all remember him playing catch with Jim Harbaugh and all of that stuff. Well, he... Uh, I, I'm sitting, uh, I'm like on the ground, I'm kneeling, which I almost never do now, but I did occasionally then, uh, I'm kneeling, taking pictures. I stand up and I bump into him. I didn't even realize it was him. I bump, I'm like, Oh, I'm sorry. And then I'm like, realize, Oh, that was Tom Brady. I just bumped into one of the very few times in my life. I've been starstruck when I met him or I didn't meet him. I just bumped into him. And when I met, uh, Kevin Max from DC talk. If any, if any of you know who I'm talking about there, when I met Kevin Max from DC talk randomly on the streets of Hollywood, um, that, that was the only other time that I've really been starstruck. Um, but, uh, so Tom Brady, I'm like standing next to him. I'm like, I'm not moving. Right. Some, a lot of times, you know, you move around. I'm like, I'm not moving. I'm staying right here. And like, you know, eavesdropping on everything. Michigan's down at 21 to seven going to the end of the first quarter. I believe it was, or somewhere around there. And he has to go. He can't stick around for the whole game. He's always saying bye to everybody. And, and someone says, like, are you really going to leave now? I mean, Michigan's down by 14. And he's just like, they got this. They'll win by two scores. It's not, not even a big deal. Keeping in mind how good Colorado was, even at the beginning. I went into that game thinking this could be a lot tougher than people think. I think Michigan could potentially lose this game. And no one else was, really. It was kind of like they were brushing it off the same way people were Utah in uh, the, the couple years beforehand. And uh, Colorado was going to be a tough team. Cephalufo was pretty good and uh and then on the other end uh chidobi awuzie awuzie uh was ended up being really good as well so i i knew that they were going to be a challenge but and i'm sure tom brady could see that right i mean they michigan was down by two scores and he was right michigan won by a couple scores confidence i want to continue talking about tom brady but i want to talk about it in a different light i want to talk about jj mccarthy and how he reminds me, demeanor-wise, of Tom Brady. Uh, before we do that, uh, this year, the only app you need at your Super Bowl party is FanDuel, America's number one sports book. We're really excited about our new sports betting partner for Locked On because they're the number one sports book in America, FanDuel. And if you're new to FanDuel, that's even better. They've got so many great features that make betting on sports fun and easy. Download FanDuel now so that you can bet on Super Bowl 57 with a no-sweat first bet. You can get up to $3,000 back in bonus bets if your first bet doesn't win. FanDuel lets you bet on everything from the money line to point spreads to who will score a touchdown. The FanDuel Sportsbook app is safe, secure, and super easy to use. Best of all, you can get paid your winnings instantly. Uh, so join FanDuel today at FanDuel.com slash LockedOn to claim your no-sweat First bet on Super Bowl 57. That's fanduel.com slash locked on. Make every moment more with FanDuel, official sportsbook partner of the NFL. If you're watching, then you'll notice we lost a light. Um, my, I don't know what happened to my main lights that I could plug in, so I've been using one of these uh, tube ones and I guess doing a 40-minute 
podcast with it on. It, it's an, enough. I thought about switching it out. We get very meta on this show. Um, I like to tell you all the behind scenes, behind the scenes things that you couldn't care less about. That's what I'm all about. Thankfully, we still have some lights. Um, anyway, so I guess, con- again, continuing on from the, the thought process that I had on the other show. J.J. McCarthy. Uh, I, I, I don't remember if I put this on the podcast back when I interviewed him as a recruit. Uh, I don't know that we've ever done that. And I've, I've had a couple interviews with him. Uh, but uh, I did a long, a long one. I'm pretty sure I did. I'm pretty sure we did air it. This would have been back in like 2019. And uh, maybe 2020. Actually, it was 2020. I remember interviewing J.J. And he said that his primary focus, his primary focus was, well, I shouldn't say primary focus, but his, his main goal overall in when he looks back on his football career is that he has a better career than Tom Brady in the NFL. I think that they really mirror each other in a lot of ways. A lot of ways. You you look at just the competitive drive. I think JJ's a little bit calmer overall than Tom Brady. A little bit more chill. I mean, obviously he does the meditating of it all. Uh, I I I. But I think he has that same level of confidence. There's no part of him that doesn't think that he's gonna get the job done. I mean, I, I think that's why at the end of the TCU game. He stayed for one question and just got up. You know, he didn't he didn't have uh he didn't have Dave Abloff sitting there, you know, fending the questions. It was the the Fiesta Bowl people that was that was handling it. And so he answered his first question and just was out. And it was like there was an anger there that I haven't seen from him. And I know other people were really upset about that, in the media in particular. They were like, you, you gotta just, you know, you gotta sack up for the lack of a better term and Go out there and handle it like a man and all that kind of stuff. I, I was fine with it because I think it showed his fiery drive. Now, yeah, we didn't have as much to write about. I granted I probably wasn't gonna write about it anyway. But he you know, it, it, he was so incensed by his first loss as a starter, and it wasn't like he was crying, it was more of an anger. Mad at himself. And I talked to him not too long afterwards, and, and he, he already was focused that same night. He's already focused on 2023. We're going to be back better than ever. We're going to get it next year. And I know that's not what people want to hear in that moment. But he turned the page immediately and said, I'm going to turn this negative into a positive. And you know what? He, he, he came in as being the top dog, right? Being a five-star and while he didn't win the job outright as a true freshman, he wrested it away. He stole it from Cade McNamara, who going into his uh, his fourth year with the program as a former four-star, as a former starting quarterback who took you to the college football playoff, who won a Big Ten championship. In a lot of ways, Cade McNamara had no business losing that job. Yet, it, it, J.J. McCarthy, he... he found a way to get to get it done. And I mean, he was so accurate at the beginning of the season. It'll be interesting to see because I, I think that usually a lot, of, a lot of times the quarterback position, not always right. Because CJ Stroud played really well in his second year, his redshirt freshman year played amazing. And then this last year he played just as well, pretty much a little bit better overall, not against Michigan, but overall, I mean, I guess he played good, good against Michigan both times, but he, uh, you know, he, he, this was last year was his third year. Usually when you see quarterbacks take that big step forward, not always. Bryce Young didn't do it that way. Caleb Williams didn't do it that way. Uh, more and more we've seen some guys, you know, Johnny Manziel, Tim Tebow, uh, kind of take the college football world by storm right at the gates. And then, you know, some of them take a, take a step back. Some of them don't. I, I, I'm usually more interested to see what a quarterback does especially with the way Michigan runs its system in year three, right? That's Cade McNamara took a big step forward in year three. You know, like that's usually when you see guys where the light bulb fully turns on 
they understand what they're seeing in front of them a lot more. They understand the types of throws they need to make. They've been through the offseason multiple times. They're a bona fide leader. I think that J.J. McCarthy is really going to surprise people this next year because I, I think he is made for this. And I know that I, I'm probably in a minority here. I was so impressed with, despite the fact that in many ways, while he did help Michigan lose the game against TCU, he also helped Michigan almost win it. Some of those throws he was making were phenomenal. You you cannot debate the fact that while sometimes, yeah, he, he hangs, he leaves him short. Sometimes he throws him too long. You know, we've seen both from him. You see that from every quarterback. There's no quarterback that's just consistently like hitting every single guy in stride. But he he was making some pretty big throws. And he tried to make a couple more, and that's why he threw two pick sixes, because he hadn't had that happen yet. That's the good news in a way. Because he will learn from that. It was inopportune. It was bad timing, and it's happened in the, on the biggest stage that he'd been on. That's not great. But he's got more time. He'll learn from it. So I, I'm really excited to see what he's able to do. All right, let's move on and talk a little recruiting uh, because Michigan did get a commitment. Michigan lost uh, well, two guys that they were hoping to get. And uh, what it means for the class, we'll do that here in a second. All right, let's finish out here in the dark. <laughs> Not quite. We still got this light, backlights, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and if you're listening, you, you don't know what lights there are. For all you know, it's uh, I'm sitting in a fluorescent room, uh, which I am not. Anyway, um, it's funny that I addressed that because usually I think the listenership is still much higher than the, the watchership of this show. Sometimes you, you get the the random, you know, the Ohio State post game where suddenly it's like 20,000, 30,000 people watch it or whatever. Um, but uh, generally, I think we, we got more more listening than watching. And we have some pretty consistent uh, good watching on this show as well. So thank you to all of you, by the way. I, I do appreciate it a lot. Uh, even those who like to come on and uh, on the YouTube and do a, a little bit of the angry typings, you know. <laughs> which I'm about to go into a topic that probably is going to get some of that because it's recruiting and that's how people act. Uh, so Michigan did kind of get a, a too little too late moment um, where uh, they did get an NIL. One of the NIL things came through and that was a partnership with Learfield, which uh, gives the opportunity for athletes to, I believe what it does. I'm not a hundred on this, but I believe what it does is allows athletes to capitalize using logos and stuff of that nature with their NIL. So that if, if that's true, which I think it is, based off of the release, then that's awesome. Um, but a little too little too late, because today was signing day, and it happened after they had already signed the only guy that they were going to get, and that's Cameron Brandt. Um, we already kind of talked about Cameron Brandt. I'm going to pull him up again. Uh, just to uh, to do so. And uh, let's see, where are we here? <clears throat> so Michigan signed him. Uh, Chatsworth, California, four star, 41st best defensive lineman, meaning non edge interior guy, probably more of a three tech <clears throat> type uh, six, four, two sixty. So, uh, plays in Chatsworth that I don't know that, uh, I mean, California's a loaded state, so it's kind of hard to, to tell what is and what isn't good. Chatsworth's kind of, I, I think <laughs> someone who lived there, I, I've always thought of it as being kind of North of East Valley. I'm not a hundred on that. Uh, I don't know that that's like necessarily a great, uh, area or not as far as football is concerned, but it, year round training. So there you go. Uh, decommitted from, uh, he flipped from Stanford. So, uh, that is good. As far as teams that offered him, he had pretty much every pac 12 school, maybe every pac 12 school, Cal Stanford, Colorado, Oregon, Oregon state, UCLA, 
USC, Washington, and Washington State. So missing Arizona State, Utah, and who else? I don't know. That's pretty much all of them. Um, so uh, really kind of thought more in line of, uh, of those as far as non, uh, non pack 12, uh, Nebraska, Nevada, Michigan. That's it. <laughs> That's it. Um, but the rest are basically all pack 12. So, uh, but you know, thought of being pretty well, I think it, it fills a gap. You just visited a, a week and a half ago. So uh, that's good news for Michigan. The bad news for Michigan is they lost out on the Nicholas Harbor sweepstakes, um, a, a sweepstake that became increasingly about NIL and all of this stuff. But is it is it that bad? I mean, yeah, it would have been great to have that five star to kind of at least point to this class and say, there's a five star. Michigan's got some momentum. Cool. But given that, like, Michigan saw him as an edge rusher, granted they would have taken him for anything that he wanted because he's that type of athlete. He's more of an edge rusher, and as in their eyes, and yet he is looking to play a skill position on the offense. Wants his name called and all that kind of stuff. More focused on track than football. Did suddenly make such a switch to NIL that he hired a marketing firm. I, I don't think that it's necessarily a giant loss from a perception standpoint. Sure. But I don't know. Right. Like now if he bulks up and ends up being an edge and being the second coming of Jadavian Clowney at uh, South Carolina, then yeah, it will feel pretty bad. But I don't think it's that bad except from just a general perception standpoint. Uh, would have been nice for Michigan to have that high end player coming off of what they've just done. But you can save that for 2024, right? Like right now, 2024's got five commits, four or five stars, or four stars rather, <laughs> four or four stars, and they're looking to get yet another four star on Thursday. So they're in good, they're in good shape for 2024. That's the good news. 2023, maybe it wasn't that great, but it, we're acting like 19 according to on three. Um, I don't know what they finished on 24 seven. Let's see. I think I have it up here. Uh, where where did they finish? 19. Well, 18 on the composite. That's not bad, right? That's not like, we're, we're not talking like, like Michigan was 35th, right? They, they're, they're still there with talent. And if some of these, they, they would be higher. Some of these three stars, they got end up turning into four stars. Right. That's, that's the good news, right? If, if, if one of those receivers that isn't Carmelo English ends up playing really well, if uh, a guy like, uh, well, Cameron Brandt, who's a three slash four star, depending on Trey Pierce, Kendrick Bell. I mean, that's, that's a good one. Rian Ishmael, you know, some of those guys end up being playing above their station. And then you get on top of that. One of the four stars playing above their station, a la a Blake Corum or an Aiden Hutchinson, then it ends up boating well. It doesn't have to be a whole bunch of hits. It can just be you get a couple hits, at, especially from that lower end, and it changes the outlook of what that class was. Surround them with talent because, remember, 2022 actually finished pretty well. Ninth in the, the 24-7 sports composite. You had Will Johnson, Derek Moore, Darius Clemens, all kinds of guys in that class. That class looks pretty good. You surround that this class with talent. That's fine. If this next class ends up being like 20th again, then maybe we got a problem. We'll see. Once Michigan signs with uh, the rival agency, um, I know who it is. It was report. It was officially reported, and I I'd, I'd heard it from another source. So. Um, other than Chris Ballas, but Ballas, I'll let him just run with it. Uh, he, they posted on the on three board, but, uh, I have another source, oddly enough, my former screenwriting teacher. That's all I'm going to say about that. Um, of that, uh, who they signed with, but, uh, once they, um, once they, that finally becomes public and everything, maybe NIL will take off. So we will see. All right. Anyway, uh, that's going to do it for us today. We will be back with the mailbag probably, hopefully, um, on Thursday, unless I do like I constantly have been doing and push it to Friday. Next week, it will be on Friday. 
Uh, but uh, probably this week, hopefully, mailbag will be tomorrow. So that'll do it. Thanks for watching. Thank you for listening. We will talk to you again soon. Peace.